Lord, as Paul prayed, we commit now this time to you as we sit, Lord, under your word. Your word has your authority because it is breathed out, God, by you to disbelieve or disobey your word is to disbelieve or to disobey you because God the Bible is your word and may the sweetness of it because the passage that we deal today Lord has a real sweetness to it may that sweetness God by your grace operate as a balm in the souls of every Christian in this room. Lord, may there be a healing in souls where there needs to be healing. Would you bring encouragement where there needs to be encouragement? Lord, conviction where there needs to be conviction, repentance where there needs to be repentance. But more than anything else, if we see God, the sweetness of what David says in this glorious, glorious song. For that, God, we need your grace. And so we gladly confess our dependence upon you and pray that you in your sovereign goodness would operate now, God, for your glory and for our immense good in the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, so until September the 11th, when Pastor Philip has a special series of uh, four lessons that all the communities in the church will be doing together, we're going to be looking at psalms, uh, various psalms, and today we're going to look together at Psalm 16. Psalm 16, so please turn there, Psalm 16. Some of you know this one really, really well. Uh, it may be marked up as it is in my Bible. It's really, really marked up. Almost every line is underlined in this particular psalm. Some of you, I'm sure, have read C.S. Lewis's autobiography, which carries the unusual title, Surprised by Joy. Surprised by Joy. C.S. Lewis was surprised by the joy of the Christian life. There is an impulse within every human being to seek joy. And I want to submit to you that God put that impulse there. Now, as is the case with every good impulse, what does the world and the devil through the world try to do? Pervert it, right? The world tells you that joy can be found if you have, especially advertising world, forgive me if you're in advertising, but the advertising world tells us you'll have joy if you possess X. And how often do we give in to that? Yeah, that boy, I would be happy if I had that, right? Um, David shows us here so God put the impulse to seek joy within us. But God put that impulse because it, that impulse should lead us by his grace to seek joy where? In God himself. And that's exactly the example that David gives to us in Psalm 16, which is why this psalm is so powerful, especially as Paul alluded, uh, verse 11. So let's look at the psalm together. David is talking about his relationship with the Lord. <clears throat> the Old Testament scholars call this a psalm of confidence. And certainly David does express confidence in the Lord, but he expresses so much more. It's sort of the this, this psalm really defies uh, any categorization because it's so broad and it's so filled with joy and David, the overflow of David's joy in his relationship with the Lord. Okay, so uh, we will read, uh, Kathy is gone, so we will read the whole thing and then we will walk, walk back through it together. Psalm 16, preserve me, O God, for in you I take refuge. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. 
I have no good apart from you. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones, in whom is all my delight. The sorrows of those who run after another God shall multiply. Their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names on my lips. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol or let your Holy One see corruption. You make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Now, when I would preach, I would read the passage and always say, may God add his blessing to this reading from his holy and inspired word. So we ask for the blessing of God upon his holy and inspired word this morning. Verses one through two, David begins to speak of his relationship with the Lord um, after this initial prayer, preserve me, O God, Okay, preserve me from what? Well, if we go down to um, verse 10, you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, to the grave. So apparently David is in some kind of danger and he's asking the Lord to preserve his life. And by verse 10, he's confident that that in fact is what the Lord will do. Okay? Um, but then David says three things in verses one through two about his relationship with the Lord. See if these three aspects of David's relationship with the Lord characterize your relationship with the Lord, okay? So number one, preserve me, O God, for number one, in you, I take refuge. Now you might put out to the side, compare Psalm 11 verses one through three, which, unpacks for us what it means to take refuge in the Lord. Um, has anybody ever been in a situation where you had to take refuge? Maybe you were out uh, walking on a trail someplace and a really bad lightning. I've been playing golf <laughs> when, when a lightning storm came up and you know, lots of golfers have been struck through the years because Golf courses are wide open. Uh, so you take refuge. You find a place to go and cover yourself. Use a one iron. Yeah, you use it. That's the old Lee Trevino. So, so uh, Jim knows the old Lee Trevino joke. Lee Trevino is famous. The, the golfer famously said, if somebody asks, what should you do in a lightning storm? And he said, hold a one iron over your head. Oh. And they said, Why? Even God can't hit a one iron. <laughs> There's a reason they called Lee Trevino the Mary Max. <laughs> Good for you, Jim. Um, but in any event, so David says, I take refuge. I find God that you know, the name of the Lord, right? The proverb is a strong tower. The righteous run to it and find safety. In God, we have refuge. Think about when you were maybe really, really little, and you would find refuge in the arms of your mom or in your dad. And if you can remember back that far, think about the feeling that you had. Maybe something had scared you. Maybe the dog had barked at you, and you were, you were terrified of that. And you, but you rushed to their arms and you suddenly, you felt instantly peace and security, okay? That's David, he says, God, I'm not trusting 
insecurity for my bank account or even in my army. I trust for my security ultimately in you. You are my refuge. You are my refuge. Okay. Second thing, Paul referenced it earlier in his prayer. I say to the Lord, you are what? My Lord. Lord. Okay. Now that phrase is an echo of what? You are my Lord. It's an echo of the covenant, right? Between God and his people. Old Testament, New Testament. I will be what? Your God and you will be my people. Okay. When David says, you are my Lord, he's not being possessive of the Lord. This is a confession. He says, of all the gods that people worship out there, you, Yahweh, you are my God. You are my Lord. You're the only God that I have. You are my God, and I am your child in the covenant of grace. Yeah, Marie? Yeah, I was just, um, um, I was on a um, webinar with a uh, retail um, a couple of days ago, three, about three days ago, and one of the presenters showed a little short clip from this video called The Seed. Um, I think it, it, it's, it's, um, it's a special type of uh, ministry where they're trying to make the word of God accessible to people in uh -huh. their language. Uh -huh. And this, it was so precious. This one, uh, I believe she was a Hindu background woman. She still has uh, the little, you know, mm -hmm. thing in, the, in her forehead, and, you know, and everything. And she said in her language, so they did subtitles, that she realized now that she has been worshiping a God made of mud, God made of, of, of uh, their hands in mud, she says, she says, but now I worship the one true God. Yeah, that was so that precious. beautiful. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it is so precious to be able to say, God, you are my Lord. You are my master. But of all the gods out there, and you know that balance, that wonderful balance Paul draws in 1 Corinthians. He says, on the one hand, are those gods nothing? They're nothing. But on the other hand, they're backed by demons, right? So in, the, in, in a sense, they're nothing. In a sense, they're something because they're demonically inspired. But to be able to say, God, of all the gods that people worship, you, you are mine. And it's not because I was smart enough. I figured this out. You know, I studied. I looked at all that. And I realized this is the, you know. No. It was your grace that reached down and drew me to you. That's the only reason I can call you my God. I mean, the grace of God, the grace of God just saturates this song. The grace of God saturates the Bible, right? The grace of God saturates our lives. And look at the next sentence. Okay. Can, can, can we say this? I have no good apart from you. You ever said that to God? No good, no good apart from you. God, I have no good. That is an incredibly powerful sentence. I have no good, God, nothing is good in my life apart from you. Now, you're a good class. You're a thoughtful class. I, and here's the dynamic. I always say, I thought of three ways that that's true. And you're so good, you always give me five. <laughs> now, so how is it true that we who are, by the grace of God, his children in the Lord Jesus Christ, how is it true, or in to say it a different way, in what sense is it true that we have no good apart from God? That is, of course, a true sentence. 
But in what sense is it true? In the sense that God himself is the temple of what is good. Number three, excellent. In the and this and this is the main sense, right? In the sense that God Himself is our supreme good. Okay. If you were to if you were to make a list, okay, so so take out a piece of tablet paper and label it at the top. What is good in my life? Okay, number one. God. Okay. What would the next number be? Number 8,642. <laughs> okay. Number two is God. Number three is God. Number four is God. God is our supreme good. Why is God our, himself our supreme good? Just turn the sentence around slightly. Because God is what? Supremely good. God himself is our supreme good because God himself is supremely good, supremely great, supremely glorious, supremely soul satisfying, everything that's good. God is that thing. Anselm of Canterbury, who was a church leader in the 10 hundreds and the beginning of the 11 hundreds said, God is that being of whom nothing greater can be thought. So just think, think about what is good and then let your brain begin to hurt when you think that God is supremely, perfectly good. Mm -hmm. So if we think that without God, there would be no good. Scripture itself says all things that are good come from God. Okay, okay. So you've got, go ahead. So an opposite of that, a picture of hell without God is a place without any good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. There is no good, but you also, in the course of your sentence, you did number one. So number three is, in what sense do we say to God, I have no good apart from you? Number one, God is our supreme good. Number two, and this, these, of course, are all interlocked. Everything we have that's good comes from God. And here I'm just thinking of the direct words of James 1, right? 16 to 17. Every good and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there's no variation or shadow due to change. Okay, so God himself is my supreme good. And again, these ideas are, they're all enmeshed in one another. Number two, Everything that I have that's good is from God. Okay, my sin is not from God. Okay, that's my sin is not good. Okay, but everything I have that's good, my salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, my marriage, everything I have that's good is from God. What's a third sense? in which we can say to God, I have no good apart from you. Mm -hmm. Something that I've learned in more recent years is that we wouldn't even have light or breath in our body if it was for God. And the word says that he upholds everything by the power of his word. Mm -hmm. So his goodness is really beyond our comprehension that he, he loves us so much and he sustains man and beast regardless to whether we are even obeying him or not. He's yeah. Us. Good, Marie. So we can we can think of his goodness in terms of, in theology, what we call his common grace and his special grace, right? His common grace are the mercies that God gives to everybody, regardless of their relationship to him. He causes the rain to fall, the rain's falling on people who don't deserve it, right? People who hate God, Farmers who desperately need rain, but who hate God, are getting rain today. And they woke up this morning alive. Did they deserve it? No. Okay. So, but then the, the blessings of God's special grace, the blessings he gives to those who are his children in the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. Here and here. I want to say, 
he is good because he sent us good for he sent us Christ. Okay. We said anything bad for him. Yeah, okay, so the supreme expression of the, that's a great, yeah, the supreme, what's the supreme expression of the goodness of God? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the incarnation, the embodiment in flesh and blood of the goodness of God. He went one fan one fan that's right yeah he challenged the person who was questioning him why do you call me good okay only one is good the lord alone good good georgia god is good because he created the world and everything he made in the world is good and he blessed it and it's good mm -hmm. his creation in the beginning until we polluted it was all of it was very good it was a good creation you know i hear people say the people in the world, the world. Uh, this, what is this world coming to? It's, it's not the it's not the world. Don't come here. The people in the world make me. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Creation groans under the weight of our sin. Okay, so just to review, we have we're asking the question: In what sense do we have no good apart from God? We said one in the sense God is supremely our good Himself. Number two, in the sense everything we have that's good comes from God, James 1, 16 to 17. Tom? Yeah, one thing that we have that's very good, but it also is shared with all other humans, is we bear God's image. It may be distorted and, and that, but we bear God's image. Yeah, the goodness of God's image in us that gives every human life value. And I argue every human life value from the moment of conception myself. Okay, excellent. Mm -hmm. When you walk in the spirit, that, uh, that's in, you know, not that's not apart from God. So it's, it's goodness and you walk in the spirit, but um, it is it is not apart from God. It's just it's not a, it's not a, it's yeah, in Yeah, one of the major manifestations of God's goodness toward Christians is when we walk in the spirit and we experience that good that God has for us. Excellent. One more. Romans 8, 28. God, okay, we have no good apart from God. Third, in the sense that God is working all our circumstances for good, right? Okay. So third, God is working all our circumstances or good. Now remember, good here is God's definition, right? Okay, I have no good apart from you. That's God's definition of good, not necessarily mine, but whose definition is wiser and better? Mine or his? His is infinitely wiser and infinitely better. But just ponder that sentence. Let that sort of sink in and say that to God. In your prayer time, this week, you know, why is uh, the end of verse two recorded in the Bible? A hundred reasons, but one is so that you can pick it up and you can use it in your prayer time. In your prayer time this week, this just occurs to me. I, if the Lord reminds me, Lord, please remind me. I'm going to do this. Say, I have no good apart from you, God. Have no good. Train your mind to say that this week. And see what difference that makes. Okay, I have no good apart from you. So uh, David sees uh, God as good. But then verse 3, what about the people of God? As for the saints, the Hebrew is the Kadosh, Kadoshim, that is the holy ones. As for the saints in the land, they are the excellent ones in whom is all my delight. Huh. So David is certainly going to express delight in God here. But if we delight in God, we delight in the people of God. So I, I thought, I saw, usually I, yeah, I come in on Sunday morning, grab the cup of coffee, Begin to talk with people, sit down. Paul, pray, you know, Mark comes and leads announcement. Paul prays. Uh, then we pray around our tables. 
Um, look around the room. Do you find delight in these people? Do these people delight you? When we go to the auditorium later, we sit under the preaching of the word. Today, we observe the Lord's Supper together. Is there, a, is there a joy that comes to your heart from being together with the people of God? Or like Marie's experience, when you meet people from other nations who may not speak your language and you find that they are fellow believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there a bond? Is there a joy that you take in that person? David said, the true believers in Israel, they are the excellent ones. In whom is all my delight. So the person who delights in God is going to delight in the people of God. Do you remember that section of C.S. Lewis's The Screw Tape Letters, where the, the Englishman that the junior demon was responsible for has become a Christian. And C.S. Lewis says, Don't worry. I mean, we, we've lost him, but it's not as if we can't compromise his Christian life. And I recommend that you use the church, <laughs> specifically the people in the church. Like the grocer who hands him the bulletin every Sunday, who's sort of a, eh, eh. the devil wants to rob us of our delight yeah. Yeah. in the people of God. Okay. So David doesn't just delight in the Lord, he delights in the people of God. By the way, why should we delight in the people of God? And this is not saying overlook sin, of course, not, it's not saying that, but just in an overall general basis, there should be a delight in our hearts from the people of God. Why? Mm -hmm. Rachel? I think it's that life of blessing affects the people around you. Yeah. 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 Yeah
their drink offerings of blood I will not pour out or take their names, the names of their gods, on my lips. Okay, so David delights in those who truly belong to the Lord, the holy ones. Whom doesn't he delight in? Those who worship idols. Now, probably he has in mind here um, his fellow Israelites who would worship the Lord, quote, worship the Lord, but just to make sure all the bases are covered, they would worship all the gods of the people around them too. You know that that was consistently a temptation. Even in the, the golden calf incident, you know, Aaron creates the golden calf, the people worship it. And what does Aaron declare when he gets a little bit afraid? Tomorrow we'll have a day of worship to Yahweh. <laughs> Okay, so it's like, remember the Athenians in Acts 17, Paul walked through Athens, and what did he see? Yeah, statues, yeah, statues to various gods, and then one to the unknown god, why? Yeah, just make sure we... We don't want to miss anybody who might be out there. <laughs> so we're going to dedicate this statue to one whose name that we may not know. That's a temptation. It's a temptation for you and me as Christians. For example, now, okay, I will trust in the Lord for my future, but I'll also trust in how much money I have in the bank, how much money I have in retirement, what the doctor says in my annual physical. Okay, I'll try. So I'll trust in the Lord, but I'll trust in these other things as well. That's called syncretism is the worship of the Lord and the worship of other gods. And David says, I can't stand that. I can't stand that. I will not take the names of the other gods on my lips. Will not even pronounce their names. God, you're the only one, the only one. Okay, so this is such a remember, marriage is a picture of. The relationship between God and Israel, Christ and the church. Okay, and in marriage, I say to my wife, You're the only woman for me. You're the only woman for me. She says, You're the only man for me. There is an exclusivity. And our relationship with the Lord is the same. You're the only God I have, only your name. I will take upon my lips and I won't have anything to do with those who mix it up. Mm -hmm. I'll be going through Isaiah and there's this picture of God's judgment on Israel and Judah for trusting in the horses of Shinnerab, or you know, Shinnerab is about to attack and so they go to Egypt because they have a powerful army or any other nations that are supporting Israel. They're trusting those things other than God and God is constantly telling them, trust me, not in these men. And so he brings this judgment upon all those nations. Yeah, yeah. Constantly, this is a great point. In the Old Testament, for what two sins overall did God almost constantly say to his people? These are the two characteristic sins. Number one was worshiping foreign gods. Number two, though, was making foreign alliances, trusting in other nations. And do you see the parallel in that? Okay, here I'm worshiping other gods. Here I'm trusting in the nations who worship those gods. It's not, I'm not exclusively trusting in the Lord. I'm not exclusively worshiping the Lord. So there's a, there is, that's a great point. Okay, uh, verses five and six. Love these. Okay, so I'm going to read them. Somebody's going to tell me the Old Testament background to these verses. Okay, all right. Verse five The Lord is my chosen portion, and my cup is the Lord your chosen portion. I know in the big picture He is, but in your everyday decisions, is the Lord your chosen portion? Okay. Or is food your chosen portion? Is television your chosen portion? Okay. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. 
You hold my lot. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. What's in the background in David's mind in verses five through six? It's an Old Testament event. And he's reflecting on that Old Testament event. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm thinking about the um, uh, point in time where um, David had said that to God that he wanted to build a house for him. And then God uh, said to him that, um, that he would, well, I'm just going to paraphrase that. After God basically said, you know, what house can you build for me? You know, and then he he actually said to him, so that I will build a house for you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. and Certainly, so David, said, yeah. Yeah, yeah. If you look at Second Samuel seven and then Second Samuel eight and the corresponding passages, first, certainly David considered that part of his inheritance. Absolutely, Paul. Good, Marie. Very good. As uh, as the Lord brought them into the promised land, it was uh, divided amongst the different yeah. clans. Um, but for the Levites, they were not given a portion of the land, but God would be their inheritance. Yeah. Excellent, Paul. Excellent. So he's reflecting on the time when Joshua brought the Israelites into the land. And notice the word, you hold my lot. Okay. The land was divided up by casting of lots that the Lord would direct at that time in you know, his people's history. But for one tribe, Levi, so Judah and Benjamin and Issachar and Reuben and Manasseh, they, Zebulun, they all get an inheritance of land, specific territory, either on the east bank of the Jordan River or the west bank of the Jordan. But one tribe didn't get any specific land, any specific block of territory. Who was it? the Levites, and God explained why. He said, you're not going to receive an inheritance of land, why? I'm your inheritance. Now, if, um, if you were to write a will, and if you have children, put your children in the will, which would they prefer, land or God? <laughs> I mean, we can't exactly enable our children to inherit God. God's got to do that. Okay. But you see what, I, I think Paul put his finger right on it. Okay. He says, look, verse five, the Lord is my chosen portion. Now, David was of the tribe of Judah, right? And Judah got land. But David sees himself as having the same inheritance as the Levites did, as the priests did. My inheritance is God. Now, if, if we're right on that, if Paul and I are right on that, look at verse six with new eyes. The lines have fallen for me in place in pleasant places. Okay. Do you find God himself to be pleasant? Now, that might be an adjective that's unusual to apply for God. But look at the next one. Indeed, I have a beautiful inheritance. Psalm 27, verse 4. One thing by David, one thing I have asked of the Lord, this I will seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to... Gaze upon his beauty. To gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. I mean, among 10,000 other things, God is a beautiful God. He is a spiritually beautiful being. As your soul, because God created it this way, desires joy. 
which desire can be satisfied only ultimately in God himself. So God created your soul to desire beauty. And that desire can only be satisfied ultimately in God himself. We've already said God is supremely good. With God's supreme goodness is his supreme beauty. David says, God, I want to see your beauty. Now, what advantage do we Christians have over David in seeing the beauty of the Lord? C.S. Lewis in Reflections on the Psalms calls it the fair beauty of the Lord. What advantage do we have over David in seeing the beauty of the Lord? He says, I want to gaze upon your beauty. What advantage do we have? Good, Willie. God has revealed his beauty to us in the person of Jesus Christ. We have seen Jesus. David could see his descendant dimly. We have seen him within history, within space and time. And ponder this thought. At what moment in the ministry, the earthly life, Jesus Christ, is the beauty of God most clearly revealed? In his what? Okay, that's part of it. I wouldn't say that's supreme, but that's part of it. I would say it is baptism when God talks. Okay, that's part of it. Really? At the cross. How is the beauty? Because, and this is the supreme irony. This is, you know, Pastor Phillips has been talking about, you know, the Sermon on the Mount, the upside down kingdom. God does lots of things that are upside down. If you saw Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ, how beautiful is the crucifixion physically? It's, it's gruesome. It's, and when we consider Christ's innocence, it is doubly ugly. And yet, this is the moment in which, where is the holiness of God revealed more clearly than any place else in all of eternity? At the cross. Where is the wisdom of God revealed more clearly than any place else in all eternity at the cross. Where is the love of God revealed more clearly than any place else in all eternity at the cross? David says, my inheritance is a beautiful inheritance. It is God. Okay, we need to move more quickly. Verses seven and eight. What's the consequence of seeing that God is his inheritance, and God is a beautiful inheritance. Well, verse 7, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. Okay? I bless, I praise the verb barak. Okay? I bless the Lord does mean praise, but it has the implication that our praise causes God to be happy. Okay? Or God finds, God condescends in his grace. Let's be really careful in our language. God condescends in his grace to take joy in our praise of him. I praise, I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. So here he's praising the Lord for the wisdom the Lord gives. In the night also, my heart instructs me. I have set the Lord always before me. I couldn't help but think here of, um, so because God guides him, David you know, is, is, sees the Lord as his guide and he follows. He sets the Lord always before him. I couldn't help think my wife has, and probably a lot of you have this for your car, a little device that you can put your phone into it, a little holder. You can put your phone into it while you drive so that you can look at the GPS. <laughs> okay, so there's your guide right in front of you. You see, okay, your guide. Um, and David says, God is my guide. Can I keep him in front of me so that I know which way to go? I have set the Lord always before me. 
because he is at my right hand. So now he's before, but he's also at my right hand. And we're going to circle back. So just say, uh, note verse 11. He's going to talk about the right hand of God again. I shall not be sacred. All right, verses 9 and 10. We're rushing, so we're sure to get to verse 11. Therefore, okay, because the Lord gives me guidance, my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. My flesh also dwells secure in the guidance that God gives. But then there's something else. Verse 10, for you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, the grave. Okay, uh, so... David sees here that he's in danger and he gets a sense that because of the God of God's guidance, he's not going to die in this particular dangerous situation. God is going to carry him through. He senses that from the Lord or let your Holy One see corruption. Now those, that sentence is famous. We're going to come back to it. Let's get to verse 11. The summary, you make known to me the path of life. So in that guidance, God guides us in life. It's the, it's the two ways, right? It's in the Sermon on the Mount. It's in the book of Proverbs. It's the way of life and righteousness, the way of wisdom. You make known to me the path of life. And then the really beautiful phrase. And look at the, the two parts to this phrase. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. Now think of the happiest moment of your life. Okay, I can actually pinpoint it for me. It was during our wedding ceremony because we didn't, the church didn't have a center aisle. So my father-in-law walked my bride-to-be down here. And because of the way the church was built, I couldn't see her until she turned the corner on his arm. And we were old fashioned. We didn't see each other on the wedding day before the wedding. We didn't do the pictures beforehand, which aggravates everybody who has to wait at the reception. <laughs> <laughs> so be it. <laughs> and I remember specifically, just involuntarily, when she came around that corner, this happiness just over it like seized me it wasn't something i even produced it was just a response to that okay but even that was that fullness of joy think about it in heaven in the presence of god you will have fullness of joy and then look at the next so what is fullness of joy we have an experience here. It's beyond our experience here. It is the highest joy that you've had multiplied infinitely. And how long is it going to last, somebody? The first 10 minutes? <laughs> At your right hand, there's that phrase again, our pleasures forevermore. Jonathan Edwards said Every second you're in heaven, you will get happier okay, for all eternity. <laughs> Randy Alcorn in his book, Heaven, has that wonderful little sentence. Just when you think to yourself in heaven, it can't get any better than this, it will <laughs> for every second of all eternity. Just go home and ponder that, Dan. Yeah, no, 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 don't do that yet. Don't, no, 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 you're not allowed to do that yet. We're coming, we're coming there. Okay, just, just give us one minute. Yeah, just give us one minute. All right, we, we'll go ahead. We're getting close to this. Yeah, go ahead. Where are you? Yeah, yeah, excellent, excellent. Yeah, uh, John 17, I be prepared. He says that they may, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Turn to Acts 2 also. 
Okay, Peter's Pentecost sermon. So this is Psalm 16 is a Psalm of David, right? So when David says, in your presence, there's fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. He's speaking as David, right? Right? Yes. Okay, yes. Don't. <laughs> he is speaking as David. Acts 2, 25 to 28. Peter is in, okay, so start in verse 24. Peter's coming to the, sort of toward the end of his Pentecost sermon. God raised him up. Loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says concerning him. So David says this concerning himself, but he also says it prophetically concerning his descendant, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. I saw the Lord always before me. For he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart was glad and my tongue rejoiced. My flesh also will dwell in hope. For you will not abandon my soul to Hades, okay, the, the Greek form of Sheol. Or let your Holy One see corruption. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. So Peter, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, takes what David wrote about himself in Psalm 16 and puts it in the mouth of Jesus Christ, which means that ultimately we said, we think, when David says, you will not let your Holy One see corruption, you will not abandon me to Sheol. David was in danger, and he had a sense that the Lord would deliver him from death. But that deliverance by God of David was only the dimmest foreshadowing of what? The deliverance of Christ from death in the resurrection. Do you see? That's what Peter's saying. He's saying Psalm 16, verse 10, was a prophecy of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was true of David in those original circumstances. He did not see the grave but, and did not experience corruption. Jesus did see the grave, but he didn't. He only remained there 40 hours or so. He did not see corruption. God raised him up. Okay. But, but it's not just a prophecy of the resurrection. Notice he quotes the first part of verse 11 too. You will make me full of gladness with your presence. So David says to God, in your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. Who also says that of God the Father? God the Son does. So we're seeing, do you see how wonderful verse 11 is? This is why Paul Amos loves it. David's not just saying, though he, he gloriously is saying, Lord, in your presence, I experience joy. But it is an, our joy in God is an echo of God's joy in himself of the joy of the Son in the Father and the Spirit, the joy of the Father in the Son and the Spirit, the joy of the Son and the Father, and the, and the joy of the Spirit in the Father and the Son. When Jesus was baptized, what did the Father say? Behold my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Okay. An expression of the joy that God has experienced in himself. The Son rejoices in the Father and the Spirit. The Spirit rejoices in the Father and the Son. The Father rejoices in the Son and the Spirit. They've had this experience from all eternity. And look what God says. We talk, you know, when David says, I have no good apart from you, 
guess what God does? It, so I'm performing a wedding this week. And so I've got an invitation to come to a wedding. That's wonderful. Imagine if you got an invitation in the mail one day. And it said, dear Christian, I invite you into the experience I have had from all eternity of fullness of joy and pleasures forevermore. Signed, God. That's what he's done. He has invited us into his joyous experience of himself for all eternity. Is there any wonder, therefore, that David writes, again, in verse 2, I have no good apart from you. How good is God? Let's pray. God, you are infinitely good. We all know the answer to that question. And all of us could tick off a million good things. But Lord, it is true. Uh, as these saints have said, that our highest good is you yourself. It's in you, God, that there is fullness of joy. It's at your right hand, no place else in the universe, that there are pleasures forevermore. God, the fullness of that experience will only be ours in eternity, but it is your intent that we would begin to experience tastes of that joy even now in this world, in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, when we taste your goodness, we cannot help but declare it to others for the glory of your name. Grant the increasing experience of everyone in this room, God, by your grace. Grant an increasing experience of verse 11 in our lives. I've prayed this off and on for years. Lord, help me to live in Psalm 1611 by your grace. So grant that, Lord, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. That's our signal. <laughs>